Thank you, Graham. The follow-up to that is, of course, that you should all go to Paris before June 14th. Uh, may I have the first two? Um, my, the topic that uh, was announced, namely Titian's brushwork, is one that I meant to change because what I really want to talk about is Titian's brush. And I begin <clears throat> with, by introducing the master himself in two self-portraits, the more vigorous one, obviously preceding the later one. The one in profile shows us the artist, probably about 1570, in other words, into his, um, into his 80s uh, in age. And it shows, in each case, we, have, we, meet, we meet the most famous, the most powerful painter uh, in Europe, uh, an artist who was extremely aware of himself, of his profession, of the power of his art, of the power, ultimately, of his brush. And indeed, it is, as I said, the brush that I'm concerned with. Uh, and I begin with an anecdote. Titian was visited by one of the imperial ambassadors to Venice, and he came upon him um, <clears throat> painting, as he describes it in a letter, he said, the, the, man, the old man was painting with a brush as big as a broom. And when he was asked why he painted with such an incredibly large brush, uh, Titian responded by saying, well, other painters paint in different ways. Michelangelo paints in his manner, in a fine manner. Raphael paints in a fine manner. Parmigianino paints in his fine manner. And he also mentions Correggio. He said, well, I didn't want to be a mere imitator. I wanted to establish my own manner. Now, the, the, the story comes down to us in the literature. Um, it, doesn't, it didn't until recently have a long pedigree. But on, only in the last 10 or so years have scholars dug up the actual letter. Uh, the imperial envoy Vargas wrote this. Uh, the letter was published in the very early 16th century, and indeed there is also a manuscript copy of it. So it's one of those stories that was too good to be true, but turns out in fact to be true. And indeed Titian was famous for painting with a brush that was unlike anybody else's brush. Broader, wi wider, wilder, bolder, and it was at once accepted and questioned by the culture for which he painted. Now the painting that I, I, I bring on here, the painting that I will start with and come back to uh, later, uh, is a picture that, uh, like the Vargas letter, was known only indirectly for many years, in fact, until basically until 1983, when it came out of Czechoslovakia for the first time uh, since it entered Czechoslovakia, and you know, we're not quite, well, it goes way back to the 17th century. And it was shown in London. It's a painting that was questioned by scholars who said that it wasn't, couldn't be by Titian. The great Erwin Panofsky rejected it because it was too bloody and he didn't think that Titian would indulge in such blood letting. Uh, it represents the flaying of Marcius, uh, punished by Apollo for his impudence in challenging Apollo to a music contest. And the, uh, the punishment that Apollo chose for him was that Marcius be flayed alive, and that's exactly what we confront. And it was felt with a shiver that Titian, the great Titian, the great painter of human tragedy and of uh, human emotion, never would indulge in that right down to the little uh, sort of King Charles Spaniel lapping up the blood that's flowing from the upside down uh, satyr. Well, when we all saw it, there was no question that it's Titian, uh, blood or not. Indeed, it was important that there was blood in it because there's so much flesh in it. And it is exactly that quality that began to provoke old questions. <clears throat> 
questions that art historians indulge in that painters, I suspect, are less involved with because I think that they find the question perhaps um, irrelevant, a purely rhetorical exercise. Is it finished? Now we know that a great many of Titian's paintings were left in the studio in a state of what we can only, I think, call relative finish. Because Titian, like Picasso, said a painting, it didn't say it, he manifested this, a painting is never quite finished. And we, indeed we know in many cases he sent out paintings to patrons who themselves were rather unhappy with them. They were unfinished. The brushwork was too bold. You, you, saw, the, you saw the brush strokes. And even Philip II of Spain, who would become Titian's greatest late patron, um, Philip complained as he sent a portrait of himself to his aunt, uh, the, uh, Queen Mary of Hungary, he complained that the painter really maybe wasn't paid enough but just left the whole thing a little bit too open. Uh, had he been paid more, Philip uh, muses, perhaps he would have brought it to a higher level of finish. And the question of finish was a, an active one. Now in this case, I'll come back to this, there's no question but that the painting is finished. And I'll leave it at that. But what it does manifest is this whole sense of the brush. Not just brush work, we'll come back to brush work, but the presence of the brush itself. And as um, you saw in the late self-portrait, Titian shows himself with only two attributes. One, the gold chain that was given to him by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V when he was knighted, and the other, he holds in his hand his brush. Uh, in the other self-portrait, there is no implement of his manual labor. But this perhaps much more impressive piece of painting, which is in Berlin, um, it demonstrates something else that's related to the brush, and that is precisely the painter's hand. The hand and the brush go together. And indeed, there's a kind of critical or rhetorical etymology that's important to recognize here. Just as our notion, that is the, the concept of style, comes from the writing implement, the stylus, that is the marking instrument. So too, the Italian notion, the Italian word maniera, which also means style, ultimately goes back to manos, to mano, to hand. And this the whole issue of the artist's actual manual labor, which is of course central to the entire Renaissance tradition. We know it most conventionally uh, by our inherited notion of the artists in the early Renaissance trying desperately to redefine their art as not a ma mechanical or manual art, but rather as a liberal art. Something that culminates most wonderfully within the studio world when uh, Bernini, taken around Paris to see a lot of paintings by Poussin, comments to sum it all up when he, by saying, il signor Poussino lavora di là. He works up here. And that, of course, is exactly what Italian art theory in particular throughout the Renaissance had been driving at, namely that namely taught a, at least theoretically, a dissociation between manual application and intellectual conception. The idea in the mind of the artist and then the mechanical realization of it which lends itself to the rhetoric of theory. But it doesn't, it doesn't at all lend itself, as most of you know better than I, it doesn't lend itself to practice. There ain't such a division. You can't work that way. As the great French phenomenologist Merleau-Ponty said, uh, you can't paint with a mind. The painter takes his body with him. Well, this was, um, this was recognized. Uh, it was recognized very fully within the uh, context of the Renaissance itself. Uh, the debate over whether the hand it was merely a slave to the mind found rhetorical and poetic expression. But basically, Michelangelo himself never let a day go by without lifting hammer and chisel right to the end of his life. To, you want to keep the hand in it. The mind can keep working on its own. 
Now the hand itself, of course, obeys, it not only obeys the body, it obeys certain rules. And before we come back to approach the question of Titian's brush, we have to recognize that it operates within a comparative context. The observer Vargas, like so many of his contemporaries, recognized that Titian's rough brush work was different from anybody else's. And they recognized in that brushwork his style. Or as the connoisseurs would later say, or even in the 16th century would say, they recognized his hand. But there are technical preconditions for this. A painting appeals to the body, that is, it responds to the hand in different ways. And we can go back to the Vargas dialogue and to Titian's own response, where he said that Parmigianino painted in his, in his way, Raphael in his way, I want to paint in my way. He wanted to find, as he said, his own maniera. And it, we can approach this not through Parmigianino, but through Bronzino. I mean, it all would have been perfectly valid. It's exactly the kind of comparison that Titian himself was invoking. Titian's um, Danae, the second version of it, I'll come back to the first version in a a little bit later, uh, which was painted for Philip II, uh, is generally in the Prado, but is now in Paris, for those of you, again, traveling, uh, on the one hand. And then on the other, uh, Bronzino's uh, allegorical image of Venus, Cupid, and Time, a painting in the National Gallery in London. I bring them in as two avatars of stylistic alternatives. Uh, we could say Venetian on the one hand and Florentine on the other. We can say Venetian colorito on the one hand and Florentine disegno on the other. Although when we say Florentine, that is when we say Venetian colorito, we're not talking about Venetian color. We're talking about Venetian coloring. The standard distinction between so-called Florentine drawing and Venetian color uh, is basically a misunderstanding and a mistranslation. I, I don't think that I have to dwell too long on the Bronzino to demonstrate that this is a superb colorist in a tradition that will find um, another master centuries later, namely in the 19th century, in Angre. These are artists who study color with a deliberateness that Titian would never have dreamed of. Bronzino runs a blue through its entire gamut until it becomes almost white, the kind of studio problem that you yourselves will set up here uh, with white crockery, white bed sheets, and so forth. How many colors can you find in white? It'll be the task that Monet will set for himself. Titian doesn't. Titian's painting is, is really quite different. The color that comes out is, is, is in broken touches. It's a coloring that emerges from essentially a neutral or middle tone ground. It's a color that emerges and never declares its own total independence. The touches mate might do that, but never the color itself. Whereas Bronzino, who contains his color within a very carefully bounded drawing, gives the color its due. Each color has a chromatic identity. That identity inflects itself or is inflected in as nuanced a way as the painter can achieve. And what we recognize is that deliberateness of color. Now, what underlies Bronzino is not only the clear drawing, but a clear uh, support, a clear ground. He's painting on white. Titian is painting on brown. Bronzino is painting in transparent, um, if not exactly glazes, he's painting in, in, in translucent layers of color that require the, that the light be able to penetrate them to reflect, ultimately to reflect off the white ground itself. There's a chromatic clarity that is consonant with the clarity of drawing. Whereas again, Titian, as, and we'll see exactly how this works out, Titian is building up on a toned ground, whereas Bronzino's whites depend primarily upon the underlying gesso sort of plaster coat. Titian's whites, his lights, are thickly painted lead white, which are then modified by glazes or overpainted. In Bronzino, the white itself has the least 
actual pigment. In Titian, the white has the most pigment, that is, it's the most densely saturated um, kind of color. It's opaque. It's not only opaque, but it's, it's, it's impasto, it's paste-like. It has a substance. Bronzino's does not have a substance. So the entire, the, the entire kinetic experience of painting becomes somewhat different. Bronzino is painting on a flat surface. Titian's surface is not only not flat because it's woven, it's a canvas, but as he paints, it's almost in a, well, I, I keep having to reach forward, but I don't think it's illegitimate. It's like Monet covering his painted surfaces with lots of, in effect, wasted paint just to build up a surface so that he's painting on that kind of geological, corrugated, um, rough fabric. Now, the, um, d d as a quick footnote to, uh, to the Bronzino, Um, I want to turn to another panel painting, uh, in this case by Raphael. Uh, it's a panel painting that's about five inches square. And yet, for that painting, we have what underlay as well Bronzino's painting, and that is a full cartoon. That is a drawing that is precisely delineated, and what you also see, I hope, uh, in that drawing is that those contours have been transferred mechanically to the panel. The contours have been pricked with a large pin or a small nail, and then the surface has been pounced with a, a gauze bag filled with, with chalk dust, and the dotted contours are transferred mechanically to the, the surface. This very careful procedure, in effect, places, we might say, barriers between the executing body and the work itself. That is, there are many stages, and the stages themselves are very carefully worked out so that, in the case of Raphael's famous studio, once this cartoon, on a large, the larger scale of frescoes, once a, once a cartoon like this is done, Raphael can let assistants transfer it. Or, in the case of Michelangelo, who finished the great battle cartoon for the um, the, the Palazzo della Signoria in Florence, as he said, I finished the cartoon, I thought I had earned my money. All that remained in effect was to transfer the drawing to the wall and color it. Now, he would not have left the coloring, as we well know, to assistance, but certainly the transfer would have been left to assistance. Something happens, and one can point both to the moment and to the individual. Something happens in the history of painting to change this procedure. And that something is the coming together of, of a certain kind of support and a certain kind of medium. The support is canvas, and the medium is oil paint. Neither of which is invented at this moment, but the moment is the first decade of the 16th century. And the individual is Giorgione. What Giorgione comes out of is a, an older tradition, and I show you a, a painting by a, a painter whom, who deserves your attention, even though he doesn't make it into most of the um, textbooks, and that's Cima, uh, Giovanni Battista Cima da Conegliano. And I, I bring in a picture of a panel painting by his that's unfinished, as you can see. The drawing has been worked out, it's been inked, that is, it's been brushed in rather carefully. You can see that the the modeling has been hatched in with the point of the brush, and the color is beginning to be applied, the color being contained within the bounding contours of the drawing itself. And in this respect, even though a Venetian painter, he's following the procedures that we met in Bronzino and as well in Raphael. Uh, the final effect uh, is something that you can measure for yourselves in the work of the greatest of the painters uh, of the 15th century Venetian tradition and one of his greatest works, which is just uptown in the Frick collection, namely Giovanni Bellini's uh, St. Francis, with that whole sense of the glow of, um, of, of profound light is 
based upon the transparency of oil glazes and ultimately the whiteness of the prepared gesso surface of the panel. All of this changes with Giorgione. Uh, not in obvious ways at first. I mean, I show you the three philosophers, something that Michel Laclotte had tried to get for the exhibition in Paris, but one of his few failures. It still is in Vienna. Um, and a detail of the oldest of the three uh, magi in this case. Uh, without talking about Giorgione's style, uh, it's only his technique and what has been revealed in the study of Giorgione through x-rays. Uh, this old head was originally painted this way. What you're seeing, of course, on the sides are, uh, are the, is the wood of the stretcher with the nails entering, uh, but with one nail entering anyway. Uh, but as you can see, the face has been changed really quite radically. The headgear has been changed. Uh, this is a result of the revolution that Giorgione effects. It's the revolution that you are all heirs to, and that is opaque oil painting, something that you may take for granted, but it has a beginning. The kind of oil painting that allows the artist to either scrape off with a palette knife or to let it dry and paint over. When Jan van Eyck, for example, wanted to make changes in the great Ghent altarpiece, in order to re-prepare his surface, what he did was put in silver foil to cover over what he had painted and then to begin again. In this case, as you can see, it's just a question of taking opaque color and overdoing it. Now, it seems uh, like a minor kind of change, but it can have profound effects. On a relatively small picture, by Giorgione, the fame, his most famous picture, uh, The Tempest. Uh, X-rays uh, long ago revealed that major changes occur. This, by the way, is not an X-ray, it's a retouched photograph. Um, and what we find is that in place of this challenging shepherd, uh, soldier, wanderer, whatever he may be, uh, Giorgione had originally intended to have a nymph, a nude, seated along the riverbank. She was entirely painted out. This kind of change was, was criticized by the most powerful critical voice of the 16th century, namely Giorgio Vasari, who claimed that, well, this is what he said about a great many Venetian painters, uh, that basically Giorgione had abandoned the rules of, the good rules of painting, and um, essentially, in abandoning those rules, he set painting back. The rules that Vasari had in mind were those that require that a composition be prepared very thoroughly in preliminary drawings, and that eventually those drawings yielded the final composition in drawing, namely the cartoon, which then would be transferred to the painting surface. That way, all of your decision-making, all of your changes occurred on the much more uh, open, in the much more open arena of graphic preparation. And then when you got to the wall or to the panel, you knew exactly what you were doing. Unless, of course, you changed your mind. And then you had problems. In fresco, for example, if you were really painting in warm fresco and you changed your mind and you wanted to keep painting in good fresco, you had to knock out all the plaster and replaster and start over again. The same was true in panel painting. You had to do something to re-prepare the surface. But in painting on canvas, you could do something else. You could paint over. Now this, of course, meant, means some, I mean, there's another prerequisite, and that is deeply involved with Giorgione and ultimately, as Vasari recognized, with Leonardo before him. And it, that is, once again, working on a middle tone ground so that indeed you are building up your whites in opaque color. It's a purely technical thing, but it means that you have covering power and it means that you can make this kind of profound change because there's an awful lot 
of lead white in that seated nude to be covered over. Indeed, because there was so much lead white in that nude, she comes out rather well uh, in the x-ray. Now, to, this is what Titian himself inherits. Uh, he doesn't exploit it immediately, but let me just take you into the ways in which he does um, operate. Uh, the earlier, the, probably the first version, there may have been another lost one, of his, the composition of Danae, that is a reclining nude, um, who, I mean, the story itself involves the, well, it's another failed effort at safe sex, one might say. Um, Danae is, it is predicted that Danae will give birth to a child who will slay her father. The father, needless to say, is concerned and thereby, and therefore locks his daughter up in a, in a tower to assure that she will never conceive. However, uh, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, is smitten uh, for, with the young woman and enters the tower and the woman in the form of a shower of gold. She gives birth to Perseus, who does indeed kill his grandfather. And it's, it's just another example of how you don't mess with fate. But um, for Titian, it is I suspect there's a loose wire somewhere here. I, on the right? Ah, oh, thank you. For Titian, um, again, we have an x-ray. It's a magnificent, it's one of the most magnificent, I mean, uh, x-rays, remember, come in, in plates only this large. So to get an x-ray of a large picture, and the picture itself is, both of them are about the, the size that you see them on the screen, maybe slightly larger. Uh, what you're looking at is a composite of, of several plates, as you can see. Um, and what is coming through uh, is this basic, uh, as it were, groundwork in lead white. Now, the x-ray was shown at a, an exhibition in 1977, and then it's been lost. Nobody knows where it is, which is really unfortunate. It was fortunately published in a small photograph, which is what this uh, slide was made from. It was made by a a medical radiologist who had a, a, a side practice, the x-raying of, of paintings, and he died and nobody knows what happened to his files, which is really a, a shame. I think it is, anyway. Uh, the x-ray reveals something fascinating. Not great radical changes in the female nude, but if you look beyond the Cupid figure, you'll see uh, that there is an opening uh, between her head and the cupid, there is a, um, a, an isolated column there, and then what I'm, talking, what I'm talking about is this bit of white there, which you will recognize in a moment, uh, because it, it, it demonstrates that the painting itself began life as a variant of another picture, and that other picture is one that's fairly well known to you, namely the Venus of Urbino. Um, in fact, we know a good deal about the relationship of these two pictures. The Venus of Urbino, uh, which was sent down to um, Francesco Maria della Rovere in 1538. Uh, and in 1544, we know that in Venice, Titian was working on the, the Danae. He was working on it for Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who was going to be responsible for bringing him down for a visit to Rome uh, the following year. Uh, the poet, the writer, and envoy, once again, uh, Giovanni della Casa visited Titian's studio in 1544, and he waxed quite eloquent over this picture. Um, he was, he said that indeed it was incredibly sexy, that it would, um, as he said, um, well, I don't know quite how to translate that. He said it would bring the devil to the back of a certain cardinal in the Curia, uh, which um, I guess tells us something about one of the cardinals in the Curia. But then again, remember the picture was being done for Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, um, who hadn't yet discovered his potential pop 
Babeli Tan, and that is, he hadn't yet decided that he wanted to succeed his grandfather as pope. In any event, um, Della Casa makes a very explicit comparison. He's trying to whet the appetite of, of the, his patron and um, indicating that Titian had not yet painted the head and that if the cardinal so desired, Titian would, when he got to Rome, put a portrait of one of the cardinal's favorite courtesans on this lush body. But what he says explicitly is that this painting is so erotic that it makes, as he says, the nude for the, car the, the Duke of Urbino, he says, it makes this one seem like a theatine nun in comparison. Now, without getting any further into the iconography of the female nude, uh, my, my point is Titian's working method. Uh, just as Titian brought, probably brought the Danae to Venice, uh, I'm sorry, to Rome with him to complete there in the studio that he had in the Belvedere, which was the site of a famous visit of Michelangelo, who came away saying that Titian certainly could imitate nature better than anybody else in colors. But isn't it a pity that the Venetian painters never learned to draw properly? It's one of the great stories, and of course, Vasari himself is um, Michelangelo's guide. And uh, whether Vasari invents it or not doesn't really matter. It really does express what the entire 16th century thought. Michelangelo is the great draftsman, Titian was the great colorist in the sense of imitating nature in colors, that is, in paint. Now, this kind of transposition of one composition into another, this kind of variation on a theme, is an important part of Titian's open process. What we, what we have documented in other cases, and what we can infer in this case, is that before this painting left the studio, some version of it, presumably, if we, if we are talking about the x-ray on the screen now, if a, if a version like this, already a variation, had been wrought as a kind of copy. Because as you mostly know, Titian's Venus of Urbino itself, that is the figure itself, is indeed based upon an invention by Giorgione, a painting in Dresden, now in Dresden, that Titian himself was responsible for completing after Giorgione's death. So Titian begins to inflect the Giorgione invention, not only here, but in other compositions. I mean, especially as he makes the reclining nude his own personal iconography. Now what is, is of a special interest to us, of course, are the mechanics of these variations. The idea that a composition could be started based upon a previous composition, just blocked in, sketched in, and then kept as a record not in careful drawings, but as a new preparation. So what we have is a situation in which a canvas, before it goes out of the studio, is recorded in what is a, well, a ricordo, a record. And in the case of Titian, it is recorded in a, a newly begun picture, which, as soon as he takes it out again and starts to paint, paint on it, is no longer a ricordo, just to play with the terminology, but becomes an abozzo, a sketch, a painting that is sketched in and becomes, becomes the basis for a new picture, as the Venus of Urbino's variant became the basis for the Danae. Now what the presence of this handmaiden kneeling at the marriage chest indicates is that the painting had not yet become a Dane. It hadn't yet discovered, as it were, its own, its new iconography. The only variation at this moment, in, at least as revealed in the x-ray, is the variation in the nude, who becomes a much more active figure. And one can only speculate that, indeed, it was in the course of this dialogue with his own picture that the possibilities, you might say, of interaction that is, of the figure interacting with something else became possible. A process that Leonardo had two generations earlier already articulated, namely that you, in your own messy sketches you discover new ideas. So the open technique itself is part of Titian's process, even though these pictures can hardly be called 
are never would be subject to the arguments about finished or unfinished. They are clearly highly finished pictures. Now, I want to go back to first to Titian's earlier work, that is the sacred and profane love, which I bring in just as an example, and back to another story, um, or not a story rather, but another anecdote or descriptive, analytic description, put it that way, of Vasari, who is in talking about Titian's art and his career, even though he is uncomfortable with this, the openness, nonetheless, and this is the glory of Vasari as a critic because he was a great critic, and he was a great critic because he was a painter. Not a great painter, but a great critic. Not, not an, I mean, a phenomenon that many of us are familiar with. Um, in any event, Vasari talks about the difference between Titian's early style and his late style. And in his early style, he, he says, Titian brought his paintings to really quite incredible finish so that you could look at them from close up and they, they constantly held their illusion, is what he's saying. But then he's talking about the later style. The later style. I mean, that would have done also, but this is better. Uh, this is a nymph and shepherd in, in, in the museum in Vienna. He says, but Vasari continues, but in his later style, um, Titian abandoned that finish. And he says his later works are painted in great strokes of the brush, big masses of color, um, macchie, big blotches of color. So that, he says, from close up, they don't look like anything. All you see is the chaos of, of, of these strokes. But as you move back from a distance, they become nature itself. Now, this is, of course, um, something that we are familiar with. Uh, it's one of those terrible uh, things that are told to students uh, in talking about Impressionism, namely you've got to step back and squint so that the Monet looks like a picture postcard. Now, no painter ever really does that. Um, I mean, painters paint at arm's length plus whatever inches of the brush may be. And there is that whole sense of the contact with the picture that is obviously lost when you step back and take it all in and squint so that indeed you can discern the iconography on the Cathedral of Rouen to stay with Monet. Now, Vasari is extremely appreciative of this, even though he criticizes it in his discussion of Giorgione. That is, this open work that looks like nothing and yet is something. This open work that, that is, is just a mess when you're up close, and yet from farther away, it all becomes more real than nature. And of course, what he, what he recognizes without articulating, because it is a truth that goes way back to antiquity, what he recognizes is that the open work not only invites but demands a projection on the part of the viewer and the, it is the active participation of the viewer in bringing it to some kind of pictorial closure that guarantees its mimetic success. Now this brushwork, the product of Titian's brush, by which of course I mean Titian's hand, this brushwork was articulated by Titian himself in very special ways. And while there's very little in his writings, that is in his letters, that tells us much about his art, his painting itself has an articulateness that is unrivaled, one might say, in the history of, of Western painting. And I'll try to back that up, such broad generalizations. By turning first to, well, certainly the greatest Titian in this country, um, and that is the Rape of Europa in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Um, here, what Titian does is, in effect, lay down what might be om considered almost a kind of Venetian academic lesson, or academic lessons in Venetian, uh, in Venetian colorito. For one thing, the painting itself and when you get there, uh, it's, and the painting is hung too high and it's very hard to see. Uh, and maybe though, after what we've done to Albert Barnes, maybe we can break Isabella Stewart Gardner's will and bring the painting down to where we can see it. Uh, maybe. In any event, the picture itself is an extraordinarily tactile surface. No surprise. 
But the tactility is controlled with a mimetic rule that really is quite amazing. That is, in the sense that the painting, the figure herself, which is by far the most Rubensian of all Titian's nudes, Rubensian in the sense that um, one senses the, the dimpling of the flesh. And in the dimpling of the flesh, what one has is the working of Titian's brush, of his hand, and I mean that literally, of his fingers. And I'll come back to this later. But Titian, like Rembrandt, eventually is painting with his fingers. In other words, there is a plastic quality in the relationship, plastic in a purely sculptural sense, of modeling, of, of pulling out, of pushing in. The whole, the whole the physicality, the somatic quality of painting is transferred to this nude. So that the old man, and here we are dealing with, with a, a, a man uh, close to 70, uh, the old man himself is finding in the paint very clearly a surrogate for flesh. And I don't mean this in any simple sense. I mean, it is, of course, the kind of thing that we know best from, from, from Picasso's self-iconography. But there's something, I think, much more subtle because it is much less overtly proclaimed in Titian because it's built into the technique itself. There is the, the sense of corporeal, of the corporeal, of the physical in the figure herself, which is the most thickly painted, in effect, along with the bull, that is, the, the heaviest whites are there. Or the glossy whites and um, glazes that make up the fins of the so-called dolphin for the voyeurist little Cupid who's following uh, Europa as she's taken out to sea. Um, or the whole sense of using the ground itself. I mean, this is where Velasquez learned to paint. Of using the ground itself as a correlative for distance. That is, the least physical aspects of the picture are those that are beyond touch. They're on the far shore. It's a, for m most of us who have grown up painting within this heritage, I mean, it's a natural thing to do. Somebody invented it. Somebody discovered that the weave of the canvas could produce a certain kind of effect. It wasn't Titian for the first time, by the way. Carpaccio does it. But these are the technical, what Vasari will call in his own descriptions, of, of pictures and in his own aesthetic evaluations, the things of art, the cose dell'arte. These are the tricks of the trade. This is the studio knowledge that Vasari brings to his criticism. And it's a studio knowledge that the, certainly this audience uh, recognizes. And as I'm saying, uh, ought not to take for granted. So that the articulateness of the brushwork here, that is, it's, it's, it's uh, obedience to mimetic ends is fairly clear. But it's even on a higher level, if I can talk about in this, in this conceptual way. Now it's Titian who works up here, uh, although also with, with the rest of the, hand, the fingers on that hand. Uh, I turn to another uh, relatively late painting from about from 1560, let's say. Uh, a painting that is also, well, I mean, you may have seen it when the petition show in Washington. Uh, it is currently not in the church of San Salvador in Venice, but is in the show in Paris, an Annunciation, uh, where I'm not, I don't want to talk about um, the most obvious parts of the heavenly setting, because the, the, the correlation between open brushwork and, and, um, and heaven is, is an extension of that atmospheric uh, effect, but rather about something much more deliberate. I'm sorry that the slide is so dark. Um, and that is, and that is this unit down here, which is a, one of these art historians' delights because it is, um, it's iconographically so rich, and it's so traditional. And you can talk about the history of painting from Van Eyck on. Uh, and, but it also carries, a, and I'll show you this a little bit later. On the step, there is a uh, an inscription that gives it a clear articulation. Uh, 
what you see is a vase, a crystal vase, transparent, filled with water, through which light passes. Uh, it, it contains a bouquet of flowers beyond any botanist's knowledge, uh, although they look perfectly natural, the petals and so forth are there. Uh, the inscription underneath it, however, articulates the very clear, unambiguous, symbolic meaning of this. Uh, it's a description of the burning bush, the bush that burns but is not consumed. Now, the burning bush, like so many other aspects of um, uh, the Old Testament, uh, was appropriated as an epithet for the Virgin Mary. At this moment, she is conceiving while remaining a virgin, just as the bush burned and was not consumed. But Titian takes the iconography one step further, and the, the crystal vase also goes back to uh, Marian liturgy. Uh, in the late medieval poems that Jan van Eyck in particular exploits early on in the history of oil painting, that is, in the history of the medium that allows for this kind of, of translucent, transparent, luminescent painting, uh, the Marian poems that celebrated her and her virginity by comparing her to a crystal vase. As light passes through glass without breaking it, so the logos, so the spirit of the Lord entered, the, entered Mary without breaking her virginity. Now these are images. They're poetic images and they are entirely that within the liturgical literature. literature. It took painters to realize them. Whether Jan van Eyck or Titian now, because what Titian does is to take the burning bush and to paint it, at least some sprigs of it, because these are not flowers, these are flames. This is Titian's brush playing with its own possibilities, but within the very, very strict limits of Christian iconography. And I mean, I would argue that the greatest iconographic experts in the history of Western painting were Western painters. They're the ones who painted the stuff, they knew more about it than anybody else, including, including the priests. I, I'll argue that elsewhere if you want, but not here. In any event, I can, I can <clears throat> uh, perhaps <clears throat> in an engraving, the detailed slide of which I lost, uh, the, an engraving after this painting um, by Cornelius Court. I mean, here is the inscription, Agnes Ardens et non comborens. Uh, you may be able to, those of you in the first row anyway, may be able to see how the engraver interprets it quite literally as a, a bunch of candle flames coming out, whereas Titian, of course, was able to exploit the very nature of the brush stroke itself. Now, I said I'd come back to this, and I want to conclude in, well, yes, basically conclude with the Marcius. In the Rape of Europa and in the, in the Annunciation, what we have is Titian's brush, we might say, in its most academic mode. That is, working with imitation, that is, in representation of body, of fin, of fur, of water, of distant shore, of distance itself, but creating the illusion of, um, of three dimensions and space, and spatial extension. In the case of the Annunciation, Titian's brush uh, is playing, as it were, with his own particular kind of iconographic expertise. It's in the service of an idea. When we come back to the Marcius, we can say that Titian's brush, again, is in the service of an idea, but it's an idea that in effect breaks down whatever the threshold or the barriers may be between conception and execution because it's the idea of the body itself. I mean, we tend to talk about Titian as the painter of the female nude because he painted so many of them and he made that kind of iconography his own. And yet, I think perhaps there's no painting more than this one that demonstrates the kind of confrontation between the self of the painter and the other of the canvas. And I'm not trying to, to, to Lacanianize the analysis, but it is a question of confrontation. It's a question of painting and other, which is an extension of oneself.
It's the kind of thing that we would have no difficulty with if we were talking about abstract expressionism. And it's not, as I have been accused of doing, that I'm trying to impose 20th century values on a Renaissance past. What I am trying to um, argue, proclaim, uh, declare, is that those values are not strictly 20th century values. The making of images, the making of others, the making of another body. I mean, this has been something of fascination ever since we have the stories of, of Pygmalion or Narcissus. This whole question of self-imaging, of identifying. I mean, you know, the, we can pick up the stories of Michelangelo when asked why he never married to create children. I mean, that, who would be like you know, Bernard Shaw, children of genius and so forth. He said he didn't have to marry to create children. His works were his children. Now, I mean, again, whether true or whether he said it or not, <clears throat> there is built in to this culture that is of the 16th century, this sense of the identity of the artist and his work. It comes out in, in a beautiful passage that is published in a very little known book, a book on the art of memory, published in the very year of Titian's death, that is 1576. And it's basically an extension of <clears throat> Platonizing Petrarchan notions. But the writer describes the old Titian as basically falling in love, he says. No, he puts it this way. Titian couldn't paint another figure, whether male or female, without falling in love with it. I mean, we can find the same thing if we just riffle through Picasso um, quotations. The sense of desire, the sense of identity, the sense of reaching out. I mean, all that is involved in that actual physical application, the extension of your body onto something else to create something that's going to come back at you, whether it's de Kooning's Woman One or Titian's Marcius. So that here we can talk about Titian's brush. Um, I'm sorry, this was a point, a footnote, art historical footnote, uh, down below, just to, to settle once and for all whether Titian thought the picture was finished or unfinished, it's signed. I mean, it's perfectly, technically legitimate signature. It wasn't painted later. Footnote, as I said. Uh, but the painting itself is remarkable in lots of ways. And um, now that it has been, as I said, publicly circulating ever since 1983, uh, we've had a chance to see it on many occasions. And it is as remarkable as you can imagine, even from these terrible slides. What is perhaps as remarkable as anything else about it is that it is essentially conceived as an altarpiece, as a martyrdom. That is, we are given the body of Marcius, not in any narrative sense, as Titian's so-called sources, that is, as models presented, but we confront the body of Marcius. Cruel Apollo, who is flaying him, still kneels before him. Marcius is strung upside down, the better for the blood to rush to his head, of course, um, as part of his martyrdom, just as St. Peter was um, crucified upside down. But above all, Marcius is presented frontally in maesta, as we would say. He is there for our contemplation. There is nothing between him and us except the little lap dog, of course, lapping the blood that flows from him. It is the human body. And it's a human body that, uh, <clears throat> as you can see, is made up of inflected surface that really corresponds not quite to any kind of anatomical detail, and yet we are persuaded by it. It is paint become flesh. And I mean, it's, it, it's not, I, mean, I, I don't invent this, obviously. And yet, it, it's impossible to stop from invoking the wonderful uh, quick comment of, of de Kooning, uh, who might as well have been talking about Titian, and indeed probably was, when he said that flesh was the reason oil painting was invented. He had the female body in mind, but it doesn't matter. And indeed, it's important, I think, in this case, that, that in a certain sense, that a kind of, of 
simplistic or reductive sexuality doesn't get in the way of, of the relationship between the maker and the maid. Now, the descriptions that we have, one final anecdote in a sense, we have a description of Titian, the old Titian at work. Um, it isn't published until a, a century after his death, but its claim, the claim is that it is based upon <clears throat> the words of somebody who was with him in his studio at the end. And it is very much a description that, as we say, is, if, if not true, at least well found, well invented. Uh, it talks about how Titian built up his figures with just a couple of colors, basically with, with white and black and red on a neutral tone ground. Then he would work them up and then he would add yellow. And that, those were the, basically the supposedly the four colors that Titian worked with. Four colors because the great Greek painter Pliny worked with four colors. And then he would, he would bring it up to a certain level of finish and then he would put the canvas away and let it sit for months. In some cases we know because of the complaints of patrons for years. And then he would take it out again and he would work on it and put it away, and take it out. And as he, when he took it out, he would scrutinize it. And, and here the, the visceral description is important. Uh, the writer, Marco Boschini, the writer says that he would scrutinize it like a surgeon scrutinizing a patient. And finding something wrong with the body, whether a growth on the arm or a misshapen leg would pitilessly, mercilessly cut off the offending part, replace it, redo it, fix the leg. And Boschini's description is beautiful precisely because it is so physical. It's talking about, an, well, the, 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 the metaphor is of the, of the surgeon, but it is, it is talking about working directly on the human body. And eventually it was brought to some kind of perfection so that Titian then would finally, with his finger, put a dab of red in the eye, and that was the spark of life. I mean, it's almost as though Boschini has Michelangelo's um, creation of Adam in mind. But then it doesn't end there. After the description of the process, it goes back to a quotation of Titian, who is said to have said that he, in making these figures out of paint, was operating as God had in making Adam out of clay. He worked with his hands. Pure rhetoric, perhaps, but it's, it's the paintings themselves that confirm this kind of direct physical contact. Just one detail, because um, I think it's a mistake simply to dwell upon the um, this single aspect of the picture. The picture has a, a a poetic completeness that is, is, is marvelous. And what I want to show you just is, again, a detail of some of the most wonderfully open passages, but also of a figure whom I, I think is extremely important precisely because I think it can be identified as another artist, and that is Orpheus, who is telling the tale, um, and who is completing the affect of the picture in a way by with Apollo's own stringed instrument is singing praises to the wind instrument of Marcius, which is set up as a trophy. I mean, it is, it is part of, as I say, of the moving affect of the picture. But then um, the final painting uh, is, that I want to show, is related to this. And it's almost as though this, the Pietà that Titian intended for his own tomb it's almost as though it comments on the Marcius. I don't mean this directly, but in the sense that what, we're dis what we feel in the Marcius, both as observers and then as uh, critical, let's say, reconstructors of Titian's own process, namely this confrontation with another body, what we sense in the Marcius is enacted in the third dimension, in the third person narrative in the Pietà. In the sense that the old man the old St. Jerome approaching, I apologize for this slide, the old St. Jerome approaching the body of Christ is a self-portrait. It's Titian, the painter, whose hands now are on the one body that counts, 
And of course, here, the, the first thing that should come to mind is Michelangelo. The analogies run straight down from the, the Pietà that Michelangelo intended for his own tomb in which he too held the body of his savior, he there in the guise of Nicodemus, to the very last Pietà that Michelangelo ruined by reworking and overworking, uh, namely the Rondonini Pietà, um, in which he just couldn't keep his hand off. Off what? Off the marble? I mean, when, when the story is told, um, it is that he simply, by Vasari, uh, the story is, oh no, it isn't Vasari. Uh, it's just that Michelangelo had to keep his hammer and chisel going, just out of practice. But this is a devout Christian, and it's not just anybody that he's practicing on. And it's the same here with Titian. Both artists put themselves in perpetual touch with the body that is their ultimate salvation. Now, it's, it's perhaps um, too easy to fall into a kind of rhetoric, critical rhetoric, in talking about these experiences. But to deny the resonance, the affective resonance, is, I think, to cut us ourselves off, not just from the humanity of the artists. We don't know anything about that. But from what we do know, we know the pictures. We know what we can respond to in the pictures. And we have to be able to trust that. I mean, ultimately, what Titian is, has his hands on is, again, not anatomy. There's no body there. There's paint. Now, there is, um, I mean, there are lots of, of of, of stories that the subsequent criticism weaves in to response, that is, Christian response, which is, is important here. Uh, and there's one that I'm actually going to borrow, f not from Titian, but from another great painter, uh, who's, whom unfortunately was to be seen only in Fort Worth and not, didn't come here, Jacopo Bassano. And it's the same Boschini who describes kneeling before a Bassano altarpiece to worship the jewels of the brushwork. And he also describes how he approaches the body of the infant Christ in a, in a nativity. And it's all light and it's shining and he comes closer and closer to it. And the body itself, he says, disappears into pure brushwork. That is, the divinity manifests itself in all of its ineffability. Now that, as I said, it's, it's, it's rhetoric, but it's beautiful rhetoric. It's the rhetoric of somebody who is also a painter, an artist, not a good one, once again, but who understood that the relationship of a viewer to a picture is more than just a critical di keeping a critical distance. It is a recapitulation of processes, of the processes that went into the making of the picture. And those processes are physical. And as much as Titian worked up here, it's the entire body that fell in love with the objects that he was painting, whether they were the models or the pictures themselves. Which is why, as I said, I don't want to talk about Titian's brushwork. I wanted to talk about Titian's brush and the hand that held it. Thank you.